Hi, everybody, and welcome to Gen Friends. I'm Sherry Hudson Passy, your host, and I'd like to welcome everybody here. We have got a great panel here tonight and uh, we are going to talk about the season um, this season's episode five of finding your roots and we have terry o'connell the um from in-depth genealogist she's the executive producer so come, uh, executive director i always want to call you a producer <laughs> executive director of the in-depth genealogist hi terry hey how are you I am so good. I'm glad that you're here tonight. And we, <laughs> sorry, and we've got Melissa Barker, the archive lady. Hi, Melissa. Hey, how are y'all doing tonight? Doing great, doing great. Glad you're here too. And we've got Catherine Lake Hogan, and I always like to say all the way from Canada, but you know, you never know where anybody is watching. They could be in Canada. And uh, anyway, she's, she is look, look, looking for your roots. Looking for looking, ancestors. Looking for, looking for ancestors. Yeah. I know that. I know that. <laughs> you know I know that. And yeah. well, how are you? Are you good? I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. Are you cold? Uh yes. Are you guys okay? All right. <laughs> <laughs> and last but certainly not least, our special guest tonight is genetic genealogist Cece Moore. Hi, Cece. Hi, thanks for having me. We are so excited to have you. Um, we're so excited. This this episode was just full of DNA. It needed the DNA to get to a point where they could understand and, and know their ancestors. And we had uh, Michael Strahan, who is a co-host of GMA. He's also a former professional football player. And we had Esipatha Apatha Merkerson, who a lot of you know from Law and & Order. And uh, she's also done some episodes of Chicago Med. And she's been in a lot of things. She's been on you know Broadway and all sorts of things, all sorts of movies. So. Both of their stories were very interesting. Both of them were searching for answers to, you know, their past. And both of them being African American, um, there can be some struggles in, in getting that done. So let's let's start off by talking about Michael real quick, because I really just want to talk to Cece. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, it was really interesting that uh, he discovered on his paternal side that his ancestors actually started a town. They came out of slavery and were able to own property. And I thought that was wonderful. And not only did they own property, but can anybody else remember what else they owned? They owned the grist mill. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, schools, schools. church, yeah, yeah. Yep. all sorts of things, all sorts of things. And there was even a um, plaque with the name of the town on it. And so, you know, he says, I've been there. It's in Texas. He says, I've been there, but I didn't realize, I didn't realize it was us that <laughs> started it. Mm -hmm. And so now he wants to go back, you know, and, uh, and, and it's, it's going to have a, a more special meaning. Did anybody else want to say anything else about the things that he found out, especially with, with the um, paternal side of his family. Well, I would say on that side, it was a paper trail discovery. However, you could see the connections in his DNA as well. So okay. that connection to them was absolutely confirmed through his DNA. Oh, that's fabulous. That's so great. I love that. Yeah, yeah. You know, we it's need- we need geology nerd thing. I'm like, oh my gosh, that's in here. All right, good. This confirms it. And everyone's like, yeah, we found that already. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. That is so funny. That is so funny. Um, and then they went, I'm trying to kind of go through this a little bit, maybe too fast because I, you know, I want to talk to you a little bit more, Cece. Um, but um he was saying, why didn't anybody tell me this? Why didn't I know this? And it's the same thing, that if stories don't get told, they don't get passed down and they're forgotten. Mm -hmm. So, you know, all these years is, is he lived in Texas and he um, had traveled in the areas where his ancestors were from. He never knew anything about them. And so he was talking about how he's just going to come out of that um, that meeting that you know that reveal as they were giving him his family history just pumped up and he says my swag <laughs> my swag is gonna be really <laughs> as I come out because I found out all these things um they go ahead somebody was gonna say something I could tell maybe not maybe not and um, they went to his 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 um, mother's side and it was really funny because he was talking about his mom's side and he says you know we've got the story we've got Indians you know in our in our family history somewhere 
or, you know, because my mom's got straight hair and some of my, um, some of the people on my line are light skinned. And so he wanted to know a little bit about that because he didn't know anything about his mother's side. And this is really where um, the DNA really came into play on his side. Cece, you want to tell us about finding the bishop line? Sure. So when I'm working with an African-American, particularly one who has a fair amount of European ancestry, I'm really hoping that I'll be able to identify one or more of those European ancestors. So I'll go through their match list and I'll try to find the strongest match that is a pure European ancestry, meaning someone who's 100% European or close to it, because then I know that obviously they're sharing through the European branches, whereas if it's more mixed, it's hard to determine which line it would be on. So that's the easiest way for me to kind of zero in. And once I get down to that match, I'll run shared matches or in common with matches to see who else is matching the guest or Michael in this case, and that match that is of European ancestry. So as I was doing that, I realized there was a genetic network forming and it was around the Bishop Polk family. Um, some of them were descended from both Bishop and Polk who married each other. Some were from the Bishop side and some were from the Polk side. As anyone who's worked with genetic genealogy extensively you know, is, is accustomed to, that's usually what happens. Right. But that really helped to confirm that that marriage is the one that is the common ancestral couple because we're seeing DNA from both sides of it. Oh, okay. So he had to be descended from that Bishop Polk ancestral couple. Um, how originally was the question, of course. Yes. And that's where the paper trail has to come in. And we've got to start building that family out and building them down and trying to see where he might connect. Mm -hmm. And they were able to find in a census record um, where that family fit in, where his ancestor fit in. And uh, the interesting thing was that it was, you know, this, this white man who lived just down the street, not very far from the African-American side of his family. Right. And uh, they had several children together. They weren't married, but it was illegal. They yeah. couldn't get married at that time. They couldn't get married. And so he felt that at least this was a different kind of relationship that a lot of times you're finding when you've got, you know, the African American and the, and the European, a lot of times it's, it wasn't a, um, a loving relationship. It was a forced relationship. And so they were able to determine most likely that this was, yeah, they loved each other. And, and this is, this is why <laughs> he has this uh, European. Right, line. and it's clear they had a long-term relationship mm -hmm. until later when she got married and then he got married, but over a long period of time, yeah. they clearly were involved with each other, almost certainly by choice, having four children. The fact that she named one of them after mm -hmm. him. Yes. They were, you know, they he was named as their father in several of the death certificates. Oh, okay. <laughs> A known thing, but the DNA is what led us to that census record. And that happened a lot in this season mm -hmm. where we were brick walled somewhere. You know, Johnny Cerny's team that does the traditional genealogy research side of it, you know, hits a brick wall and is stuck. Mm -hmm. And then I work it from the opposite end. So I'm working down from that Bishop Polk couple. I started following each of their children and I found William living just four doors away from. Uh, the brick walled ancestor's mother. So I found her in that census record with her mother and then her father, what ended up being her father, just down the road. And so it was purely sorted out from DNA. But of course, what we're always hoping is that the DNA is going to point us in the right direction to the paper records or to the documentary records. And that's exactly what happened here. Right, because you have to have something to prove they're in the same place at the same time. In yeah. order, <laughs> in order for them to be together to have the child, right? So. <laughs> Merely DNA. You know, you've really got to build that circumstantial case as well. So, you know, oftentimes in the African American families, we can't even find that. You know, we really have to say this is what the DNA is telling us. Here's the circumstantial evidence, and that's as far as we can get. Mm -hmm. But because this one was after slavery, we were able to be much more definitive and say, look. Here's the census record. Here are the death certificates that we found naming a William Bishop as the father. And then after all of that, 
after the script was written, it was all done. I finally heard back from one of the matches I had written to that had a private tree. And she said, oh yeah, we knew about that relationship. My grandmother talked about how William would come to the fence. I guess they had a fence that somehow connected their land and the kids would go to the fence and talk to their father and he would give them money and candy. So, oh, wow. so this was a known family relationship clearly, but I didn't hear that till after we had done the interview. So it wasn't something we could include that oral history, but that one family had passed it down when every other public family tree or any other genealogy didn't mention it. The only one that had knowledge of it had their tree private. So that was quite a find after the fact, after piecing it together, just purely <laughs> genealogy and then hearing it confirmed from a family member was really, really awesome. That is awesome. awesome. Yeah. 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 And I guess that goes to show too, you need to, you know, try to get a hold of each of those matches <laughs> and say, what do you know? Cause you know, it was one. Yeah, so, it was one. The one with the private tree, everyone else. Of course. <laughs> I of course. sold a lot of trees, but of the ones that were on there, they all dead ended, you know, right there without him on the tree. Some of them would have like William Bishop question mark or will, you know, and didn't know who that was. They assumed it was an African-American mm -hmm. and no one had, discovered that it was actually that white family, except for that one family that had passed it down. And I'm not even sure they knew exactly which Bishop family it was, but they knew that William Bishop was a European, you know, ancestor. Mm -hmm. I'm, thinking I'm thinking about, about oh, oh, do I, I've got an echo. Do you guys hear that echo? Mm -hmm. Or is it just me? Okay. Barking, but not much I can do. <laughs> That's okay. Um, mm -hmm. I'm thinking about all those families that maybe watch the show and go, oh my goodness, that's my family. And that's my question mark. <laughs> and now I can. That's exciting. I love that. I worked on one long time ago, several years ago, which was um, Tom Clicchio. And we were totally brick walled. And the DNA just addressed it beautifully. And there were lots of public family trees with that large Italian family in it. And they were all missing this one daughter. And after the episode aired, I saw her start popping up. <laughs> and it was nice to see her reunited with her family because there were like 13 kids and she was not on anyone's tree. And oh. now she is. So I like that side effect of this. That is wonderful. I wish you'd do one of mine. <laughs> I could get a side effect. I wish they'd do mine. <laughs> I want to do yours. Why don't they do a normal person? How about my tree? And I'm thinking, well, what about mine? <laughs> Not I about mine. That would be, you know what? That would be a fabulous episode. You need to talk to them about that. Because, you know, I think, I think that would be a fabulous episode. But, you know, probably everybody's thinking you've probably already done it. You know, I don't have time anymore. Pre, mm -hmm. you know. Genetic genealogy, I did a ton of work on my family. And then initially with genetic genealogy, I tested about 40 of my own family members and was working on that. But as soon as people started coming to me with their family mysteries and you know these core mysteries of their life, mm -hmm. I really haven't had time to work on my own much at all. The only time I really do is when I'm teaching an advanced genetic genealogy course and I need new material. I know that most of my students have been to so many of my presentations. <laughs> So I'll sometimes dive into mine for that, but otherwise I don't get much opportunity. Ah, well, let's put this out there in the universe. Everybody wants to see Cece, see, 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 have sure. her genealogy done on the show. Somebody <laughs> do her That's not her. what I meant, but. <laughs> no, 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 but you know, not that we've got any clout whatsoever, but you know, we can put that out. We can just put that out. Does anybody, before we move on, uh, does anybody have any more questions about this part of the episode that you want to ask or any other questions for that matter that you want to ask CC? Well, I have a couple comments about that storyline um, with Michael talking about how his ancestors thought that they were descended from Native Americans. Well, I'm going to tell you that family story is just about every black family. Yes. Sir. My husband's family, my mother-in-law, she's black Canadian, swears, swears that they are descended from First Nations, you know, because her mother had, you know, straight hair. And it just seems to be a common, it, it seems to be a common myth in a lot of Black Canadian, African American uh, family histories. And it, and I've done the family history for that, for that line of the family. And there's no, there's no First Nations, no, Af are no Native American 
in that line of the family and do a little bit more digging. And sure enough, we did the DNA testing and my husband's 36% European. That's where the straight hair is coming from. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's why Dr. Gates kind of makes a joke out of it because he's just heard it so many times and so yeah. rarely are we able to confirm it. In Michael's case, he had about 1% Native American or East Asian. We didn't find anyone in the paper trail, but he does appear to have a distant Native ancestor, but probably not, you know, why there's the straight hair. That's much more likely coming from the Bishop Polk connection. Yeah. And I would think at 1%, it's way, way back, way back. Is that, would that well, be right? Anywhere from a fourth great grandparent. I mean, you know, it, with the further out you get, the more random autosomal DNA inheritance is. So it could possibly be from a third great grandparent, but more likely a fourth and beyond. Um, uh, I have to ask you that because my mom shows that. And, <laughs> and we can't find it on the paper trail and all good Southern families have a Cherokee princess in their line. Yes. I mean, you know. <laughs> and you know, it might so, be really distant ancestors. You might have multiple 10th great grandparents that were native and it's just adding together. Oh, okay. You know, whether you've seen that in one bigger segment or several uh, distant, uh, sorry, several more distant, smaller segments, which, you know, you can't see at most of the DNA companies, but you can see that on 23andMe's chromosome view. Right. which is one reason that's a, a good, unique offering that we don't right. get. Other places. Hmm, well, that's a good clue. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that with me. Um, anybody else before we move on? I think that we should just add that on his, that Bishop Polk line, and that took him back. <gasps> that's right. Forever in Charlemagne. In yeah. to Charlemagne. Um, yeah. what was his line? He goes, I, I, not only did I come from Kings, but we also had like self-made kings here in Texas. Yes, I yeah. loved that line. It was, a, you know, such a good line. It was. I mean, it as was. we know, we're probably all descended from Charlemagne, but when you can actually hook in with the paper trail, that's what makes it unique. And we were able to, Johnny was able to connect to a gateway ancestor when she, mm -hmm. she got back far enough on that Bishop Polk line. And so, you know, that's fun. It's in some ways kind of meaningless, but it's certainly fun for a genealogy show. Right to show that that's documented sure yeah yeah it's always fun when you see yeah. things like that you know i'm looking for my gateways mm -mm. I mean, <laughs> mine mine were mine were probably living as the you know the maid to the <laughs> gateway ancestor or something like that i i i have yet to find a gateway ancestor well Would you know we're nice. the maids so that's right <laughs> through the maid <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's too funny. Mm -hmm. So let's um, let's move on to the next guest on the show, which was um, S. Um, say her name for me, right? S. Apatha. I want to say Apatha, and I know that that's not right. Apatha um, Mer Merkerson, and um, I have seen her work. She's a brilliant actress. Yes. Um, she found out some really fabulous information. My big question to you is. How how did they get back to those archives to be able to locate? I mean, what was the trail that led? Oh, let's look in the archives and see if her you know ancestors were part of the slaves that were sold to Louisiana. Was there? Do you know? Was, DNA. This was just, a, another purely DNA discovery. We were brick walled at her great grandmother Easter Hawkins. Mm -hmm. uh, didn't know who the parents were. Couldn't find anything. And when I started working with her and her mother's DNA, by the way, I always try to get the guest parents' DNA if they're living and her mother's living. So we tested her, which is super important to get that older generation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I saw really multi uh, multiple strong connections to people descended from a man named Patrick Hawkins. Well, Patrick Hawkins was a known part of that uh, Georgetown University 272. And so once I was able to connect to him, that just opened up that entire area of discovery. And we have to credit the Georgetown Memory Project. They had already done a lot of work on the Hawkins family. So it's not like we had to go in there and do all of this from scratch. So it was really just um, connecting Easter Hawkins to that known Hawkins Georgetown family that was the key. Mm -hmm. And that happened because I could see she must be descended from Patrick. She had lots of close matches, quite strong matches to his family. 
And then I followed his children down and found Peter's widow living in the census with a daughter named Esther or Easter. So yeah. that had been missed in the paper trail. It just wasn't something that was easy to find and you know, all of the records <laughs> that exist. But when the DNA pointed us in the right direction again, just like with Michael's, I was able to find that census record. And then later they were able to find her marriage record, which confirmed that Peter, the son of Patrick was her father. And so, you know, once again, I've said it a few times, I'll say it again. The DNA is so important for pointing you in the direction. So, you know, we have very limited amounts of time to research these guests and we don't have a huge research team. And so being able to be efficient, thanks to the DNA and know what we need to be looking for and where we need to be looking for, it makes a huge difference. How long do you usually take for, for each guest? Is there like a, a, an average amount of time? So, um, you know, we might have six weeks, we might have two months, but we have other guests at the same time. So we're balancing multiple guest research all at once. And oftentimes schedules change and someone has to get canceled and then someone else gets pushed in the spot and we have hardly started research. As soon as they get on the list of possibilities, Johnny and her team will try to just kind of do a skeleton tree and see what's out there. And for every guest, we ask them to fill out a questionnaire. We want to know what they know for two reasons. One, of course, it jump starts our research, but two, we want to know what they already know because we're mm -hmm. going to try to tell them something new. We don't want to regurgitate information they already have. And so, you know, we don't have a lot of time, but we've all been doing this for years, Johnny, longer than I have. Um, I've been with them now for five and a half years, almost six oh, years. Wow. So, you know, we've got this pretty pretty nailed down, but it can still get very challenging when a guest is scheduled at the last minute or pushed up a couple months at the last minute to fill a spot. Um, occasionally I'll have longer with the guest because sometimes we'll hope to get them in a season and we just can't get it scheduled because of Dr. Gates schedule or their schedule. And so I'll start working on the DNA and then they won't end up being till the next season. And that's kind of what happened with LO Cool J a couple seasons ago. Mm -hmm had a lot more time to work on that because we had his DNA for quite some time. Well, I'm glad you worked on that for a long time. That was a fabulous story. <laughs> <laughs> but then like the flip side is like um, Taya Leone. We had her tree built waiting for her questionnaire. Sometimes people take, you know, they're busy. Mm -hmm. They take longer to get the questionnaire in. When we finally get the questionnaire, it says, oh, my mom's adopted. Can you find her biological parents? <laughs> it's like, mm -hmm. Should I that part of the tree has gone yep. and start from scratch and we have six weeks at that point, you know? Mm -hmm. So I, that was Christmas a couple years ago. I had to work through Christmas, pull all nighters, oh, try to identify both birth parents. And then we have to get confirmation testing. We can't put it on TV unless we're really mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. so I have to get it done early enough that we can reach someone in that family to test and get those results back before the interview. Oh that was telling. <laughs> There's both ends of the spectrum. Oh yeah. <laughs> wow. Wow. That's, yeah. but you know what? I wouldn't want anybody else if I had to, you know, have it done in that short amount of time, <laughs> I would I say Cece can do it. <laughs> I'm not sure if anyone else like will stay up all night as much as I will. So I just, you know, I'm determined to get these pieces put together on things. So I'll, I'll give up sleep and exercise and family time and <laughs> because I just love to do this so much. Oh yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. Panels. What do you, what else do you want to ask? Come on now. I've got a question for, <laughs> okay. for CC. Um, in past uh, seasons, when we have African American guests and they do the DNA, they show them, they end up showing them where in Africa they descend from what area in Africa. and it seems like this season they're not showing that is that just not necessarily them they thought about doing or not doing it just isn't happening or is there any reason why so the scripts are really long and we spend four to five hours with the guest each interview but we can only show about 20 minutes of their interview mm -hmm. or less if there's three people scheduled that episode you know it's really hard to get everything in so every one of those african-american guests is getting that but it just doesn't necessarily end up in the show and what ends up in the show is based on reactions really 
So okay. if they have a big reaction to that, it's much more likely to end up in the final cut of the show than if they say, oh, that's cool. All right. Well, you know, whatever. <laughs> so if they are really excited and say, oh my gosh, I want to go there or I've been there and I felt really connected, you know, then we'll probably use it. So it's really just hit and miss on how they react to it, how much it means to them. Mm -hmm. But it's something I always do. It's always in the DNA script for every mm -hmm. Oh, that's good to know. It is fascinating to watch people, though, and to see that some are just kind of like, mm -hmm. yeah, like they're taking it all in. Maybe inside they're jumping. I don't know. And then some mm -hmm. is like every little piece of information, you know, they're so ecstatic. So it's it's fun to watch and see people's reactions. Well, and you never know. Like some of the people we expect to be really funny and really effusive aren't. And vice versa, some of the ones that we think are going to be shyer and not react as much are hilarious. And plan. <laughs> and it's even different, like if you're there, what it's like versus what you see on the camera. Sometimes we'll think someone's really funny and then we get it in to editing and it, it just is flat. And other people seem kind of flat and they come off tremendously. I guess that's why they have careers <laughs> on camera. So, <laughs> Yeah, it's really, it is really um, kind of random. You know, we don't know what's going to work. We don't know how people will react. And then we don't know how it's going to read on camera. And so the editors have a really tough job when they're trying to cut these together and weave them in and out, you know, cohesively. So they should get a lot of credit. I mean, there's a lot of material mm -hmm. that goes into this. And then that gets cut down to such mm -hmm. a small amount to try to make this something people will watch. And by the way, our ratings are up again great. this year. Yeah, great. so it's just increasing in popularity, which is great awesome. for technology. That's, that's fabulous. Anybody else? Um, I just want to say I, I did truly love this episode. I loved the Georgetown connection. Mm -hmm. And that she went to that conference. Yes. She was so like she had her phone, she was recording it. She was so into it. And that she was so gracious to stay and take pictures with everybody and her family. And it, it was just really like kind of gave me chills watching the, the connections being made. So that was just one yeah. thing. It's a much bigger story. Mm -hmm. Dr. Gates had said to me, you know, is there any way we can integrate this Georgetown University, you know, to 272 story into finding your roots. And I said, well, not really. I mean, you know, this is a couple of years ago when it came out in the New York times, yeah. we were so lucky <laughs> when I was working mm -hmm. on her DNA and I started seeing those matches. Not only did I see this Patrick Hawkins, but I started seeing matches that said Georgetown university memory project. <laughs> Wonderful. Oh my gosh, this cannot be. I mean, it's one of the luckiest we've ever gotten for a guest to connect to such a timely, important historical event. Mm -hmm. And I loved that it will bring even more attention to it. You know, it got a lot of attention a couple of years ago and it got mm -hmm. left. And I want this to be brought up in the public consciousness and I want those descendants to get their due. You know, right mm -hmm. now they get preferential consideration for Georgetown University, but not a scholarship. Mm -hmm. so, I feel like they deserve more. And I'm hoping that by this being in the show and starting the public mm -hmm. conversation again and Epatha being involved in it, that perhaps we'll get more movement there. Right, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I also want to say that we know that this season you've got three producer credits coming. So Thank two you. shows aired, one is to come, I guess. Mm -hmm. Congratulations. We're so excited for Thank you. you. Thank you. And it's because those are so DNA heavy. The DNA really drove those storylines mm -hmm. because I write the DNA script and I approve all the DNA graphics and all of that. My job got a lot bigger on those because mm -hmm. I had a much bigger piece of the script to write. I had a lot more fact checking I had to deal with. And then they've always sent me the final or the almost final episode to approve all of the DNA portions. And that you know, became a big portion of this. Um, and so there are certainly episodes in the past that's been true, LL Cool J, Taya Leone, but no one just ever thought of giving me producer credit until mm -hmm. this season. And since I've been with them almost six years, um, you know, it, it was time, it was time. Mm -hmm. It has been a huge part. Of course, genealogy is always a big part of this, but um, 
the fact I've always written the DNA scripts because mm -hmm. there isn't someone else who can do it. It makes my job more integral to that final, right? You know, putting oh. that all together. Absolutely. And and congratulations. And you deserved it a long time ago. So I'm glad that whomever <laughs> decided, hey. What? I mean, it never even occurred to me on those other episodes because Johnny works super hard too and she doesn't get producer credit. But the difference is I think that I have to write the DNA script. She doesn't have mm. to write mm -hmm. the, the traditional genealogy part because that's something that our producers and researchers are more able to do. And then she and Nick will fact check it, Nick Sheedy. Um, but for the DNA, there really isn't anyone who can write it, fact check it, and do the final approval of it but me. Even though we have fact checkers, they're not experienced genetic genealogists. So <laughs> I end up being the one who's responsible for all of that. And, you know, actually my background, I'm a producer of commercials and things. Before genealogy, mm -hmm. we had and still have a production company. So that's my background. So I guess it kind of makes sense. Things. <laughs> yeah. So. Well, I have to tell you, CC, that one of my favorite parts of the entire show are actually the credits. <laughs> because <laughs> being, an being an archivist and also a genealogist, I pause and I write down all of the archives that are referenced <laughs> and I look into them. So I just think it's awesome. Um, I, also, I think they actually need bigger uh, type. <laughs> I, know. They and, I agree. And they make them so small. Yes. Every season yes. smaller and faster. And when I had my first producer credit, you could barely see it because the background was light. It was over like mm -hmm. a light shirt or something. And so it was hard to even see it. I screenshot it, but you could barely see it. Every <laughs> <laughs> friends caught it because it was all over Facebook. That's right. That's right. Yes. yes. Yeah, it's an honor. Um, I wanted to go back to Esapetha, who you mentioned yeah. briefly, because I just did an event with her on Friday in Washington, D.C. We did a panel um, with Dr. Gates and Joe Madison talking about what they discovered and finding your roots and about the DNA stories. And I was fortunate enough to be able to take the car over with her and sat next to her at dinner and go back to the hotel together. She is one amazing person. So your impression of her is 100% on. And I, as I said, we're lucky she's the one who got this story because I think she'll do something with it. You know, I don't think she's just going to walk away from this. She's really interested in this whole, you know, project now. And her mom is still living and she loved sharing it with her. And it's, you know, it's, it's a big deal. She has a nephew that's mm -hmm. going to be college age soon as well. So um, she was, she's outstanding. She's a pretty amazing person. Wonderful. That's good to know. That's yeah. good to hear because I, I agree. I, I agree with your assessment of her that she won't let this go. And I think you're right. I think if anything comes of it, it's because she's going to push it. <laughs> she's a strong woman. <laughs> she is a strong woman. <laughs> she is. Um, you haven't seen the Joe Madison episode yet because mm -hmm. it's going to be the last one. So um, theirs, theirs actually could have gone together too. They have some good, you know, uh, Similarities. Oh, so they could have been cohesive, I think. Yeah. They both had some pretty big discoveries. Um, and he's also amazing. He took the discoveries in stride, even though they were pretty personal and allowed us to continue with his interview. Sort of like LL Cool J. He got a big unexpected mm -hmm. surprise, mm -hmm. but chose to let the audience go on that journey with him. Are they, is it in the contract that they have to, oh, yeah. you know, share everything or are they allowed to? Because I, I can imagine that there might be some things, because we've talked about this before, is that, you know, you're sitting there and maybe you're going to get blindsided and do you want that filmed? And do you have the opportunity to say, okay, I just don't know if I want that aired. <laughs> well, so we don't blindside people if it is um, a close ancestor you know if you find out dad's not dad or grandpa's not grandpa we're not going to tell you that on camera for the first time oh, so it's a difficult balance because pbs does have journalistic standards where we're not really supposed to share what we're going to tell the guest ahead of time however we also have ethical standards mm -hmm. and they've been really good about coming to me when there's an unknown parentage situation a misattributed parentage situation that we discover through the dna and saying you know how you ethically handle this. They know I have a lot of experience with that. And so they've consulted with me a lot. And, you know, we're not Jerry Springer. We're not going to, you know, 
Who's the daddy thing. And so Dr. Gates has always contacted these guests and let them know ahead of time if it's really an impactful thing. Now, the flip side of it is like the Ben Affleck thing, you know, where we got in trouble. So if the guests were to say they didn't want something like that in the show that is more distant, I think we'd have more trouble keeping it out, especially after what happened there. And I still don't totally get all that because it was my understanding. I was there that day and mm -hmm. his reaction to that was not that interesting. And remember, I just said reaction is what, mm -hmm. dictates what makes the show. I didn't think it was going to make it into the show anyway, because he was just like, oh, OK, whatever. I mean, he did not have a big reaction at all. And so now we have to be especially careful. So if it was something in someone's more distant ancestral past, I think it would be harder for us to keep it out of the show if they requested it. But if it's something really personal that involves them, their parents, their grandparents, their siblings, um, I don't think we're gonna air something like that if it, they're uncomfortable with it. And people certainly have the option to drop out. I mean, we have had situations where someone said, you know what, I don't think I wanna do this and we are, totally willing to let them know. And that's hard because we've done all the research. Mm -hmm. We're, you know, usually ready to go, got the script. The money's already been spent on that guest and that budget, but we would never want to force someone to do a show where they've made an unexpected discovery that is really personal and that they might be struggling with. Oh, exactly. Well, that's, that's good to know. Cause we've talked about that a few times. We had wondered, you know, and I didn't mean blindside as, and you would air something like that, that they didn't know. I just mean, as they're sitting there and you're filming, you know, it'd be hard to, well, we to hear. That, yeah. That's what I'm saying. That's good to know that you let them know ahead of time. You yeah. Know? So with Joe Madison, um, you know, we found something pretty impactful. Dr. Gates called him up and told him, said, you don't have to do the show. And he said, I still want to do it. And he said, it's okay with me if you surprise me with who it is. So wow. told him who it wasn't, <laughs> he said, I'm going to finding out on set. Whereas with Hello Cool J, we actually had given him some information about that new biological family before we filmed because it affected his mother so deeply. Yes. So it really is dependent on how they are dealing with it themselves and within their own family as far as how much we share before the interview. Mm -hmm. Wow, thank you for that information. That's really good to know. That's really good to know. It answers a lot of our questions because and we often talk about we wonder how much, you know, we'll say, well, we we wish we learned a little bit more about that, but it probably is on the cutting room floor. <laughs> you know? Oh, so, so much is on the cutting room floor. I mean, Dr. Gates will tell him, Oh, it's only gonna take two hours, you know, you can be in and out, we'll come to you. And then he's got him there for like four or five hours. And then <laughs> You know, I, I thought I was going to be out of here, but they're learning about themselves and their own families. So very few people are going to get up and walk away, you mm -hmm. know? So once we get them there, <laughs> they're kind of stuck. It happened with Richard Branson, where he was totally into it, but he had like an online interview with an ambassador of something. He's like, <laughs> really can't stay. I would love to. He went and did that and came back and finished the interview. Oh, that's wow. Right. Yeah. So these are in depth and very small, you know, very small part of it makes it to the final uh, episode, unfortunately. Anybody well, else? Cece, I know that this probably is going to be all dependent on the network and everything else, but do you think that there would ever be a show of stuff that's hit the cutting room floor or like you talked about uh, Markelson and how things have happened after? Could we, yeah. could there possibly be a show of things like that? We actually were just talking about it this weekend. Um, we talked about it a little bit over the years, but I think we were talking about it more seriously right now. We have so many interesting like DNA stories to follow up on. I still have to find George R. R. Martin's grandfather. And That's right. <laughs> you know, we didn't have, yeah. I mean, you know, with the Ashkenazi Jewish matches, you really have to have about 150 centimorgans of decent sized segments or so to be able to work with that. And he just didn't, he just didn't have any matches that, you know, rose above that and wow. dog, that genealogical spaghetti. So I just couldn't do it. And I hate to have something go to air where I haven't solved the mystery. So I'd like to solve that, bring him back. Um, early on, my very first guest was Gloria Rubin. And I've made a lot of discoveries in her DNA since that first season that I worked with them, which was season two. I'd like to bring her back. You know, there are uh, quite a few follow-ups we could do in addition to some outtakes of some of the better things that ended up on the cutting room floor. 
That'd be good. Oh, that would be awesome. We would yeah. love that. Because, <laughs> so you know, it's hard for me. The first season I worked with them, I was in agony because I worked so many hours to make sure every guest had an interesting DNA story. And 99% of it ended up on the kind of floor. And I was kind of devastated. Like, what's all this for? You know, why do, why do I stay up all these nights? Why was I working 80 hour weeks? You know, I was working really hard to make genetic genealogy a bigger part of the show, but then a lot of it just would end up getting dumped. Yeah. And now um, a lot of times discoveries are through genetic genealogy, but they get presented as paper trail discoveries. Mm. It still happens where I'm like, well, that only was discovered. No, that record was only found because of DNA, but they don't have time to explain it all. So it just looks like, oh, and we found this census record. <laughs> What you need to do is start a spinoff show. <laughs> yeah. So when I was upset that first season, they said, well, they allowed me to use them as case studies. And I love that. So I've been able to use a lot of that background information, a lot of that that ended up on the cutting room floor to teach my classes and, and presentations. Mm -hmm. So they were really great about that. And so that made it more worth, worthwhile for me. It didn't feel like as much of a waste. Huh? We could have finding your roots with CC Moore. <laughs> the DNA, the DNA, <laughs> finding your DNA yeah. with CC Moore. <laughs> for sure. That's not for every guest, but yeah, you know, I've learned over the years if, if if I'm just not finding something interesting for that guest, I got to move on. So I don't spend 80 hours a week anymore. I can't. Mm -hmm. um, so I've learned to be better balanced. You know, if there isn't something, then I just know on that one we're not going to have interesting DNA and it's, there's no point in me digging and digging and digging and trying to find something when it's probably not going to end up in the episode anyway. Mm -hmm. So I try to focus on the ones that I know are going to be really solid, strong DNA stories that have a good chance of making it into the episode now. Well, this, this, this episode really showed that, that those were amazing stories. They learned so much and it was through, you know, the DNA, it was through that connection that they were able to learn who their ancestors were and a little bit more about themselves. And that's what it's all about. I'm just worried about this upcoming season. I'm not getting lucky with the DNA gods this. Uh oh. <laughs> you know, season five is so great with genetic genealogy. I don't want to have season six be less so. <laughs> I need another Atha or you know, Joe Madison or Michael Strayon or Ann Curry, something. I oh, yes. I need an adoption. No one has come to us yet and said I'm adopted or my mom's adopted or something like that for me to really dig into one of those mysteries and we haven't had any unexpected surprises which is good on one hand <laughs> but you're trying to make good television here <laughs> you know i can pretty much always uh, identify a european ancestor for the african-american guest now whether it's a slave owner or some other situation and this season i've mostly so far been disproving family oral history or what the paper trail is leading to. They'll say, hey, can you find genetic connections to this slave owner or this potential ancestor? And I'm coming back in every instance so far and saying, nope, there is no genetic evidence of a biological relationship between these people. And so it's still an important part of the script and the story, but it's not going to make it in because it's actually refuting that you know it's saying no no that's the wrong direction we need to we need to go know. somewhere else right? yeah i haven't been able to pinpoint what that somewhere else is. <laughs> where else is so i'm getting a little worried it's like <laughs> <laughs> well how do you get guests for the show do they come to you or do you go to them how do you figure out who you would like to have on the show so it's both now it used to be more that dr gates had a wish list and we just sent out invitations <sighs> He also is fantastic about convincing people if he's at like a celebrity party or if he's in first class on the airplane. I can't tell you how many guests we've gotten because he sat next to them doing <laughs> <laughs> his travels. But he's really good about it. You know, he won't bring it up right away. He's trying to kind of get them to like get interested in doing it without saying, hey, you want to do the show and scare them. <laughs> so, um, now, because we've solved so many family mysteries, we do have people coming to us and saying, hey, I, I'd really like to be on the show. I've got this situation. Um, like Andy Sandberg, for instance, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. he really is a private person, but his mom had been unable to mm -hmm. find any success in identifying her birth parents. And they watched the Taya Leone episode and said, wow, hmm, maybe we should give this a try. 
So it's kind of a mix now where we're getting both um, some people just begging to be on, which is mm. great. And then some that we are pursuing to be on. And it really comes down to schedule. Mm -hmm. It's not so much whether they had an interesting story or not, because we don't have time to drop people if they don't have good stories. We have to find good stories for everybody. It's really just does Professor Gates and their schedule line up where we can get them sat down for an afternoon or an evening and go through all of this. Yeah, that makes sense because, you know, you're also busy. So, yes, especially Professor Gates. He yeah. is one busy guy. He's yeah. everywhere. <laughs> He's everywhere. In the air. <laughs> <laughs> well, does anybody else have a question for Cece? We've kept you longer than we promised. And okay, I'm sorry about that. A lot to say. But we, we really could sit here and talk to you all night. I mean, we really could. So anybody else have a question for Cece before we go? Yeah, I do. So I'm um, just kind of following up with the African-American uh, DNA and that. Is there one particular uh, DNA company or one particular type of DNA test that is more beneficial than another for researching African-American lineage? Really, Ancestry DNA is the okay. key in almost all of these now, just because they've got that huge database. Okay. You can run those shared matches and create those genetic networks from that. Um, I used to really prefer 23andMe when I started working with Finding Your Roots. But for solving these family mysteries, there really is no better place to have them than Ancestry DNA because okay. it's just that wealth of data. We've got so many matches and we've got so many public family trees that can point us in the right direction. Um, right. Now, of course, not all, a lot of them I have to build, but still it's nice to have some. So I get an idea of the patterns, you know, okay. that's right there at your fingertips mm -hmm. when you're running those shared matches. If mm -hmm. a few of them have trees, you can look at them. And if you can't find a shared ancestral couple, you might find a surname or you might just find a geographic area, but it points me in the right direction. So when I start building the family trees for those matches that don't have them, I know as soon as I hit the right location or the right surname or right couple, and I can't do that at any of the other companies yet. I mean, my heritage is, you know, certainly mm -hmm. um, going to get there, mm -hmm. but still with the huge database at Ancestry, it's really my go-to for family mysteries for genealogical part of the research for admixture. The percentages, I still like 23andMe. I still love that chromosome view. I can re really reach a lot of conclusions there I can't do elsewhere. Okay. Also, they have that confidence slider. So yeah. Yeah. it's kind of a surprising prediction, even if it's a small amount, like say 1% Filipino, I'm gonna go and slide that confidence slider and see, does that last, does it stay to 80, 90% mm. confidence? Because I'm not going to put it in the script or try to figure out why it's there if it disappears at 60% confidence. Right. And so it really kind of depends what part of the research I'm working on. But ancestry is essential. I, I definitely couldn't do it without ancestry DNA. All right. Good to know. Thank you. That's fabu that was a fabulous question. Terry, how about you? Got any last questions for Cece? Um, not necessarily a question, but I have a statement. Okay. And that is, we would absolutely love to have you come back to talk about your other genetic genealogy work. Yes, absolutely. Fascinating. Yeah, well, um, that's certainly taking a lot of my time. So I'm balancing both of these jobs now. I, I don't think people realize, maybe because my credit says DNA consultant, that I'm a full-time, you mm -hmm. know, production team member on Finding Your Roots, and it's been my full-time job since 2013. So I've had DNA detectives and all my pro bono work for mm -hmm. Unknown Heritage, but that's been my main job. And now I have two. <laughs> and now I have two full-time jobs. Fortunately, Finding Your Roots, I've done it long enough. I've got it pretty dialed in, so mm -hmm. I don't have to spend as much time on it as I used to. But it's still quite a balancing act trying to do both. I had promised Professor Gates, I would never leave Finding Your Roots. Um, I don't want to leave Finding Your Roots, so I just have to find a way, you know, to make both work, and it is difficult. Well, we will we will have to schedule you so you can come on and, and tell us all about that because yeah. I have got some questions. <laughs> I probably have some answers. <laughs> sure Your name has become a household name here, um, just because my youngest is a she was a criminal justice major. Mm -hmm. uh, serial killers like it's her it's weird but that's her thing and 
you know, she's like, oh, they got another one. And I'm like, yeah, Cece just posted that. <laughs> oh, I already know. Well, maybe, maybe when we have Cece back, she can come on and be on the panel and ask some she questions. Would love that. That, that would be so much fun. That would be fun. That yeah. would be great. I've been getting a lot of emails from high school and college students. Oh. It's hard to, you know, get back to all of them. But a lot of them seem to be interested in this line of work now. So mm -hmm. it's definitely changing things. As you know, there's no degree in genetic genealogy. It's, there's no credential specifically for that. Right. And so I think with law enforcement's interest in this area, we'll see, start seeing that now. We'll start seeing degrees offered in this and mm -hmm. perhaps some type of credentialing. I don't know how that's going to work out, but there's going to be a lot more interest in this area. Absolutely. I agree. Well, Cece, thank you. Anybody else before I say goodbye to Cece? I don't want anybody to say, oh, I had another question. <laughs> Are we good? All right. Oh, we could, like I said, we could talk to you all night. And I know you've had a busy day. And we really appreciate you taking the time to come and talk to us tonight. Well, it's fun. I don't necessarily get to talk about it a lot. And I do it my in my presentations, but I'm going to be doing less of those, as, as you might have heard. So I'm happy to talk about the work that goes into these stories. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here tonight and the rest of our panel. Thank you so much. And with that, we will have to say goodbye for now and we will see you next time on Gen Friends. Goodbye, everybody. Bye.